Hey, Evelyn. Hey, Melanie. Hey, Carol. Oh, my goodness. I am so excited to be live with you all for our very first episode of Smart Money Mamas Live. I'm Chelsea Brennan, the founder of Smart Money Mamas, where we help moms build thriving relationships with money so that they can create wealth in a way that aligns with their values and lets them live their best life. Our new Smart Money Mamas live show is going to be on Tuesdays, every Tuesday at 1 p.m., operating an eight-week season. So this first season is all about money and new motherhood because we know we're the mama channel, right? And we know that while new babies can be incredibly exciting and we can't wait to bring them into the world and look at all the cute onesies, we also know it's a major shock to our financial system, right? There's a lot of stress involved with all those articles out there about how expensive kids are and all the things that they need and all the things that you need to make you a good parent. And we don't want you to get stressed about your finances as you're growing your family. And so this season is all about money and new motherhood. Today, we're going to talk about seven steps to financially prepare for a new baby. This is going to talk about many of the things that we cover in our new mama money plan. So our new mama money plan is actually a workbook that helps you set your one year baby budget, lets you think about maternity leave and medical costs and all the things you need to know to financially welcome a new baby. The way these episodes will run, we're going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Sometimes it'll be just me. Sometimes it'll be me and a guest, very often me and a guest. And we'll leave about 20 to 25 minutes at the end of every episode to answer your questions. So as you listen, keep dropping the questions in the chat. I'm reading them as we go. I'm going to try super hard not to get distracted by anybody's comments, but this is episode one. So we'll see how it goes and we'll answer those questions at the end. So let's dive in. When you're expecting that new baby, how do you get prepared? How do you think about your finances and not get stressed out and not end up in a place where you spend a bunch of money on things that you don't need and end up really, really stuck on things you do need? Because that happens far too often. The first step we have to take as new and expecting moms is to know where we stand financially. I'm not kidding. You got to get up close and personal with that budget. You got to figure out how much money do you spend these days? How much debt do you have if you have any debt? And is it credit card, expensive credit card debt? Or is it student loan debt that you're okay making regular payments on and paying it off as it goes, right? Do you have an emergency fund? Are you living paycheck to paycheck? You want to get really honest about those numbers. And I'll let you know that after almost four years of running Smart Money Mamas, I know that a lot of people are afraid of getting close with those numbers. They build up this big, scary monster of what's happening with their finances, especially if they spent a long time not looking at them. And they're afraid to dive in. But once they do, even if things aren't great, it's better to know where things stand, right? It's better to be clear. You know what your pieces are and what you need to do to start moving forward. So that's the first step that you really want to dive in and take, okay? And when we do that, we're looking at without judgment. We're looking at everything without judgment. We're saying, what are we actually spending? The last, you know, look at the last three to four months to give yourself an average because there's no such thing as a normal month. Look at that debt. Make it clear of, okay, hey, we have this debt and it's a priority for us to get out of it, but we know that we have some big baby expenses coming up. And so maybe this one credit card that causes us a lot of anxiety before the baby comes or right after the baby comes, we want to make sure that gets paid off. But the rest of it, we're going to create a debt freedom plan, you know, when the baby is six months or when the baby is three months. You're going to give yourself some breathing room. The ability to know where you are is going to let you figure out the next six steps we're going to talk about where we're really going to dive in to how much money you need um, and to deal with reality and know, okay, I have this much money a month to, uh, to put towards baby things, or I've really got to pick up a side hustle or do something else, or I've got to get creative with my baby expenses, okay? So that's first step, diving in and getting clear. The second step we want to do is to prepare for baby expenses. And there are a million and one lists out there. You guys could Google, what do I need for my baby in the first year? And some of those lists are extensive. They have every little thing your kid could possibly need from baby wipe warmers to a million different teethers and educational toys when your kids still can't see more than 12 inches in front of your face, right? There's a lot of things that we don't need. And those lists can be stressful. And so what I want you to do next when you're expecting a new baby is to get figure out what do you actually need. And this is stuff. And this is also, you know, child care and just the, the ways your life is going to have to change or your hours at work going to have to change, right? And so what I recommend everybody does is A, before you start anything, get clear on your money and parenting values. 
are you generally a minimalist? Is it important for you that your home is not an overwhelming place? In that case, you really have to bring that into your baby budget, right? Before you walk into Carter's and get excited by the adorable clothes and all the things your kids could need, or before you go make that baby registry and your mom or your mother-in-law is telling you there's not enough items on your baby registry because they're going to invite all their friends and they want more things for their friends to buy. Figure out what your values are and how much clutter you're willing to have in your life, how you want that money to be used. And use that as a guidepost, okay? As you go through these, these different checklists, as you think about childcare, as you think about all these things, always come back to your personal values. And if you have people in your life who are really excited to buy things for you or just want to support you, it's okay to say, hey, we don't know what my kid is going to like or what my kid is going to need. And we'd really prefer, you know, if you want to buy something cute or something that really worked for your family, but then gift cards are a great resource, right? And I want to touch on this for a second, okay? Because, you, you know, Kate says here, we absolutely need patience. And we do with this process because one of the things I recommend is that when you, is to not pre-buy too much. And there's a lot of different people who have, different beliefs on this. But to me, there's a lot of advice out there about stocking up on diapers, right? Look for all the diaper coupons before your baby arrives and create that big closet full of diapers. Here's what I've seen happen with me and my friends. You buy a bunch of diapers, your kid comes, you bought the Huggies, you bought the natural Huggies, and you were excited about the natural Huggies. And then your kid does not like the natural Huggies and they pee and poop out of them every single time. And now you need to switch diaper brands, but you got all these boxes of diapers and some of them you can't return. And now you've just wasted a ton of money on diapers. This happens too with clothes. Like, hey, my kid's gonna be born in February. So I'm gonna buy three to six month clothes that are summer clothes. And then your kid is in three to six month clothes at month one. And now you have all these summer clothes that they aren't fit, right? Um, this is a difficult thing to do. And so I would recommend waiting, saving up for what your kid needs, and then buying it as your child needs it. Buy sample packets, buy the smallest size of diapers, make uh, smallest amount of diapers, and make sure that they work for your kid. Make sure that the clothes are going to fit for them, right? And start to make a designation of, hey, I'm willing to, to get this second hand. I'm going to look in my local buy nothing groups and consignment groups, but these are the things that I want new, and so I'm going to start saving and planning for those things, okay? One other tip on preparing for what you need, okay? We're not gonna go through a huge list, but one of my tips is once your baby is here, any time that something seems to be happening, right? They're, they're being crazy, they're teething, they're whining about their mouth, they're not sleeping through the night, wait at least three to five days, at least before you buy anything to fix that problem. Because one of my favorite pieces of parenting advice that came up over and over, and this is so relevant to our budgets because it causes so much overspending, is that everything is a phase. And with Henry, with my oldest, we went through a million teethers. I don't even want to figure out how much money we spent on teethers, right? Every recommendation, we're looking at these teething, 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 right? And then the only two things that that kid ever wanted to chew on when he was teething was a cold carrot. So like a full-size carrot, don't give him a baby carrot. That's a choking hazard. But a cold carrot or a frozen washcloth. Only things he ever wanted. Only things he ever wanted. Those teething toys, not only did they not work, but we have a dog and most of them are that weird like plastic stuff that it sticks to everything and they were just disgusting. And so we just stuck with the carrot. And so figure out what works for your kid. What other things do you already have that might be a good fit before you go and try to solve a problem that might not be a problem by the time the thing arrives from Amazon, right? So think about that as well. What I also want you to do is to think about childcare ASAP. Um, most of us know this, especially once you're already pregnant, you've been made aware, but the waiting lists at daycares, even in-home daycares are so long. It can be really hard if you're going to find a nanny or do a nanny share. Finding the right person takes a while. And so don't be afraid to do a lot of interviews, do a lot of tours. There's a very annoying thing with most child care centers where they will not put the pricing on their website. And so you're going to have to call or you're going to have to go do a tour. But start to figure out where you're, where you're going to feel comfortable with your kid if you're going to need child care outside. Those are the things we want to budget for. But really try to break down <laughs> um, what you're going to need and when. And so this is part of the thing that we do in the New Mom Money Plan. It's the part of the thing we recommend to all new moms is to figure out a year-long budget and when you're going to need it. Okay, so there's maternity costs. These are things that you're going to need while you're pregnant, like maternity pants and all, and all the things that... Um, nursing bras that are going to be coming in right before you have the baby, right? There's the zero to three month stuff, three to six and forward and put dates on it. Like, okay, we're going to need 
three to six month stuff by June of 2021 or June of 2022, whenever you're expecting, right? And then you can start to build it into your budget as you need it. When you look at that total big number, when you go to those lists of everything you're going to need as a new mom and you try to add it all up and you try to put it all on an Amazon wish list and you see the total amount, it gives you a little bit of a heart attack, right? Like it's like, how am I supposed to have all this money? but you don't need it all right now. And frankly, you don't need it all. Like I said, go back to your values, figure out what can you use secondhand? What can you ask for from a friend? What is something that you're only going to need temporarily? And you can just borrow it for a little while until you know, you're done with it. And so think about that carefully, create a one year spending plan. All right. Um, Kate says my kids only chewed on me and each other. Oh boy, that is a mess. And they do that too, right? Oh my gosh. They love to chew on my fingers or if you're nursing your nipples, ow, that's just how it works though. All right. So we know where we stand financially. We know what we're going to need for baby expenses. And when it comes to, oh, I just want to touch on real quick. I know we had some questions submitted via Instagram before this live about what are must haves and, and nice to haves and what do you actually not need? And we have a list of that in the new mama money plan. But the thing is that this is very, very personal, right? And so for some families, having a developed nursery where you've got your kid's crib and a rocking chair and all those things, that's a must have because your kid is going to sleep in there right away. It's important for you that they're in their own room, and that is really a, a crucial part for your family. It's part of your family values. For a lot of families, that kid's going to sleep in your room until at least six months, right? Even if they're not in your bed, if you're not a co-sleeper, um, they might sleep in the bassinet next to you, especially if you're nursing, right? Because you want easy access to them. And so spending money on a nursery might not be a must-have. Um, a car seat could easily be something that we think of as a must-have. Um, but when I lived in New York and when I lived in Boston, a lot of my colleagues didn't have cars, in which case, you know, really need a car seat. And so this is all really personal values, which is why when we break it out in the new mom money plan, when, it, when you look at any list you find online, I want you to think about your lifestyle, your values, and then make those checks for you. And if it's something that you think might only be a nice to have, maybe wait on it. Maybe wait and see if the net need for those objects actually comes up in your day-to-day -day life, right? Be patient, okay? The third thing is understanding medical expenses. And we're going to dive into this too deep. We're actually going to have Dr. Ashley Berkman with us later this season um, on July 9th. She's going to do an episode specifically on understanding maternity medical costs and what that looks like. But I want you to know what your birth is going to cost. Okay. And this means that you're going to have to talk to your doctor. You're going to have to talk to the hospital if you're delivering in a hospital or at a birth center. And you're going to have to talk to your insurance company. Unfortunately, in the U.S., we don't have socialized medicine, which means that the average uncomplicated delivery is between $5,000 and $11,000, and that's with insurance. That can be the amount that you owe. Obviously, if you have a deductible, once you're past that point, you only owe what you owe towards your max out of pocket, and so you're not going to owe $100,000 if you have good insurance, but you could owe five to $11,000. And so when you go and ask good questions about what is the average uncomplicated vaginal delivery cost? What is the average C-section cost? And it's going to be difficult because hospitals are going to be wary of giving you any kind of price because every delivery is different and they don't want to give you a price that tends out to be radically wrong, but they can give you ranges and you can talk to your insurance company and better understand your deductible. What are your responsibilities? What does coinsurance look like once you max out your deductible? And you can start to plan, okay? There's a couple things, a couple tips I want you to know before we move on because like I said, we're going to dive in with this with Dr. Ashley Berkman on July 9th. But what I want you to know is, A, baby is going to get their own deductible. They are going to be added to your insurance within 30 days. For the first 30 days, they can be lumped up with mom. But once they get on their own insurance, they're going to have their own deductible. So even if you've maxed your deductible for through delivery and maternal care, um, if your child needs non-well baby care, right, if they need to go to the NICU or they are sick or anything, they're going to have their own deductible. And that could mean building those costs back up. Um, Ashley Berkman is going to talk to us that she actually had twins. And so they each had their own deductible. And so there is max out of pocket for a family. But these are things you want to think about. Sometimes we assume that we've maxed our deductible and we're done, but our babies are going to get their own deductibles. Okay. And the other thing I want you to know is that medical expenses don't necessarily stop after delivery. And I don't just mean NICU expenses. I mean, lactation consultants, if you want to use a lactation consultant, 
I mean mental health care. Postpartum depression and anxiety affects a very, very large amount of moms. It affected me deeply with both of my boys. And so making sure that you have the health care support that you need is going to be important. We actually have July 13th, we have a whole panel of mental health professionals. They're going to talk to us about how to identify postpartum depression and anxiety, how to think about um handling it once we're already in that place, um, what strategies to look for. And then we're also going to have on June 22nd. So before we have that panel, we're going to have Kendra Adachi here from the Lazy Genius Method, who is going to talk about how to prioritize what we really need to do as a new mom and not getting caught up in all those expectations of what a good mom is, right? We're going to dive deep into that. And so, and then the last thing is, is postpartum care, P pelvic floor therapy, pelvic floor care. There's a lot of these expenses that continue to come up. And so we want to make sure that not only have you budgeted for that delivery, which is important, but that you've budgeted for what comes after, because there could be additional expenses that come up. Um, Kate says, don't forget with twins, if they have similar names, insurance can deny claims thinking it's a duplicate claim. Yes, anytime you're dealing with multiples or um, if you're on a family plan and you've named your child after yourself or your spouse, um, when they have the same name, that can also cause complications. You want to make sure that you um, have made it as clear as possible and that you're keeping track of your medical expenses. This is an important thing that we want to touch on, which is anytime you go in for a service or your child goes into a service, have a notebook um, or a Google Doc or a um, any kind of note account that you're writing that down, the date of service, the doctor that you saw and the service that provided. We want to make sure that you're able to check your explanations of benefits from your from your insurance company and make sure you're getting paid for what you what you actually um, need to get paid for and, and that you're only paying yourself out of pocket what a year is required of you, okay? Because there is human error involved in medical billing all the time. We want to make sure we're catching those things and that we're making the most of our health insurance and our health care, okay? So we're understanding our medical expenses. Um, Sarah says, when I went to a lactation consultant, we had to pay two copays, one for me and one for my son. That is another thing that can happen with lactation consultants that we want to be aware of. Um, and these are the type of tips that we include in the new mama money plan. But for us, when I went to visit a lactation consultant, we had the same experience, except that I had to pay out of pocket and then get um, reimbursed from my insurance company just based on how the lactation consultant worked. And so also thinking about those things, okay? All right, so we know where we stand. We've prepared for our baby expenses. We understand our medical costs. And now we have to think about our maternity leave. And there's a lot of different ways we can work as moms, right? If you're a career mom who's gonna go back to a traditional nine to five um, or go, you know, you're a teacher, you want to figure out what does your employer offer as maternity care? Do you have a certain number of weeks? Is it fully paid or partially paid or unpaid? And it's if it's unpaid, are you able to think about um, saving up sick days, saving up vacation days to use for that leave? Sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Somebody rang the doorbell, which I'm sure everybody heard. <laughs> Um, you want to make sure you're understanding what your leave requirements are and how much leave you really want. Like, um, unfortunately, 25% of moms in the U.S. go back to work full time after only two weeks. It's a financial necessity for them. And so I want you to understand, do you have short term disability coverage for, through work that will help pay for some of your maternity leave? Can you do a little bit of a side hustle or your partner do a little bit of a side hustle while you're pregnant to help you build up a cushion to take a little bit more leave? It's so important for your health and your baby's health. And so any leave you can take, we want to make sure that we're preparing for that. And then have those conversations with your employer, right? Go to them, let them know that you're pregnant, let them know um, what you plan to do for leave and come in with a plan. I think that some of the scary parts um, of, of talking to your employers, you're afraid they're going to fire you. There are protections for pregnant women, though often, you know, not often, but there are times when those are not followed and it can be put you in a really difficult position. So if you come to those conversations with your boss or with your HR representative, and you're very clear of, hey, I want to take eight weeks off. Um, I plan to use these vacation days. I know I work with my friend Sue, who does similar things than me. I'm going to make sure that she's trained to kind of pick up some of the slack. She's okay with that. That you're coming in with a plan so that they don't feel like they're left in the lurch. They are much more likely to be supportive of you through that process, okay? Um, FMLA, which is the Federal Medical Leave Act or Family Medical Leave Act, federally protects employees' jobs for 12 weeks of leave. 
The problem is FMLA up until recently was only required for people who had over 50 employees. And so a very large percentage of workers weren't actually covered by FMLA because of small businesses that don't have 50 or more employees or that had 51 employees and, and moved things around because it's expensive for these companies to do that, right? And so you might not be covered by FMLA. Some states have changed that. Connecticut is changing that, um, that if you only have one employee, you're going to need to be eligible for FMLA, but you want to know how to have short-term disability. What are your options are? Are you covered by FMLA before you go into those conversations? Okay. So um, if you want to transition after you have a baby, either being a full-time stay-at-home mom or working a side hustle or working your own business, this is also something we have to plan for very carefully. So let's take first, you want to have a side hustle, okay? This is when we need to get clear of what kind of work do you want to do? How many hours a week do you want to be working? And how is that schedule going to work with you and your partner? Will you have backup child care for those hours when you're working? There are a lot of people online that will tell you of the beauties of being able to work full time from home while you watch your baby. And that is incredibly intensely difficult. Um, Lauren, who works with us uh, at Smart Money Mamas, she does an incredible job doing this, but her kid has a different sleep schedule. So she sleeps, at, her daughter sleeps from about 11 o'clock at night until noon. And so Lauren can wake up in the morning and have five, six hours of work to do before her daughter wakes up. She's been able to shift her lifestyle to make that work. But the idea that you are going to your your toddler or your infant is going to be awake for eight hours a day while you work and it's going to be able to balance both things. That's really, really difficult. So um, think about what that's going to look like for you. And if you haven't started that gig yet, can you start to lay feelers down before you um, have your baby, before you leave your job to, to secure some clients? Um, or if you have clients, talk to them about what your plan is for leave and how maybe you can do work ahead of time to, to fill the gap from them or how you're going to help them kind of fill the gap while you take some time off. If you're transitioning to becoming a stay at home mom, there's so much information we're dumping here, guys. And so I promise we're going to answer lots of questions at the end. But if you're transitioning to be a stay at home mom, I want you to really think carefully about how well do you understand your family's finances? What are your options if your partner loses their job or something happens to them? What are your options to get back to work to make sure you have the financial protection your family needs? And then what is your budget going to look like when you go down to one salary? And can you make that changes? And are you comfortable with those changes? Really getting clear on, you know, what is that maternity process going to look like you do, right? Okay. Um, somebody said typically short-term disability insurance is a voluntary benefit. This is true. It means that during open enrollment, you have to sign up for short-term disability and have it paid for out of your paycheck. It's typically not very expensive, but you have to have checked it and you have to typically have had short-term disability for a year before it's actually eligible for maternity leave care. This is why even if you're not currently expecting, sign up for short-term disability insurance. It can save your butt in instances where you have illnesses or sicknesses that aren't related to pregnancy, but you really wanna make sure that you've had the, um, vest, you, you've vested that coverage so that you actually can use it for maternity leave if you need it for maternity leave, right? And you and as Evelyn said here, we wanna make sure we're informing HR about leave, that we're talking to them, that we're explaining our plans really clearly, okay? So we're through step four. <laughs> I'm trying to go quickly here so we can get to questions. We've got, we know where we stand. We're preparing for our baby expenses. We understand our medical expenses and we've planned for our maternity leave. Now, I really want to talk about financial security because often when you see anything about financially preparing for a new baby, people think about saving for the costs of the stuff that their kid needs or childcare expenses, or even sometimes you'll hear about medical expenses, but unfortunately that kind of gets sweeped under the rug, even though it can often be the largest expense. But we don't talk about how do we make sure that our family is financially safe? right? And this includes making sure that you have a strong emergency fund, okay? At least a month um, of your monthly spending, if not ideally three to six months, right? But we want to have, we want to start with that month amount because we don't know what our lives are going to look like, especially when little people come into the world that have their own <laughs> decisions and their own behaviors that can really throw us off. And so we want to make sure that we have what we need to get us through any of those rough patches, expenses that we don't expect. 
And so take a look. We went, we did this in where you stand, but take a look at how much money you have set aside. How long could you live if income stopped coming in tomorrow, right? Is it a week? Is it two weeks? Is it a month? Um, or is it longer? And start to figure out how can we build that into our one year baby plan, right? Can we say, hey, we have $300 a month to put towards all this baby savings, but we're going to take $100 a month of that and put it into an emergency fund until we build that emergency fund up. I want to make sure that you are financially stable and secure because not only is that available, important for you, for your mental health and your sanity, you are now responsible for another little person or possibly multiple little persons. And so we want to make sure that they're safe no matter what happens. So we want to start building that emergency fund and keeping it somewhere separate from your regular spending so it doesn't get accidentally spent. Um, mom brain, a new mom brain is totally a real thing where we get a little bit crazy and maybe we think we need a new new item and we look at our bank account and the money's there and we spend it and all of a sudden we've been dwindling down our emergency fund and when we need it it's not there so open a high yield savings account start saving money specifically for your emergency fund if you have the privilege and the room in your budget to do it i highly recommend also having a small baby emergency fund. This doesn't need to be a lot of money this could be $500 but because we don't know who our kids are going to be expenses could come up quickly right so for me I planned to um, nurse my kids for a year, both of my kids for a year. Especially with my first, we didn't buy a lot of stuff. For, we didn't buy formula. We didn't buy bottles. We were 100% we're going to nurse. Neither of my kids would nurse. We went through so many lactation consultant visits, which A, make sure your bud we had budgeted. We did have that budgeted. And two, we went to an ear, nose, and throat. We had our second kid's um, lip tie fixed, and they still couldn't nurse. And so not only did we have those expenses, but then we also had getting formula and finding a formula that worked for them, which included you know, throwing out some formula that didn't work for them, buying bottles, buying things to, to buy bottles. And so having that emergency fund, when life throws you a curveball, which it will, you're able to cover it without a lot of stress, okay? And so step six is getting appropriate life insurance. And it's really hard. The next two steps are about estate planning and real, real emergency planning. And it's hard to think about um, when you're bringing in new life. It's hard to think about any kind of end of life care. But we do have responsibility to a, new, to a new little person. And that means making sure that they are financially stable and secure regardless of what happens, right? And so if something happens to you or your partner, can you replace their income? Is your child cared for? Is your partner cared for? Most people think that they have life insurance through work and that is enough. Unfortunately, the average life insurance through work is about 50% to 100% of your salary. So about one year, half of a year to one year's salary. However, most families need about seven to 10 times their annual salary in, um, in life insurance to cover things like the mortgage and ongoing payments and replacing lost income and care of the child through to adulthood and things like that. And so you want to make sure you're securing life insurance. You can get term life insurance while you're pregnant. It's it's often the most affordable option for families. And so you can do that. I'd recommend doing it earlier in your pregnancy if possible or asking good questions. The reason I say that is because if you end up with any kind of changes in blood pressure or any, um, you have oh my gosh, I just totally lost my train of thought. Um, you have uh, gestational diabetes that can make it, uh, make them want to wait until you have delivered to secure your insurance. And so if you do it earlier in your pregnancy, often less of those issues have arisen and you'll be covered no matter what happens. They, some insurance companies also use your current weight regardless of how many months pregnant you are. So if you're nine months pregnant, they'll use that weight and they might increase your monthly cost for being a higher BMI, which we can talk about the, the val validity of that till we're blue in the face, but those are kind of the things. But you can get um, life insurance coverage as soon as possible. If you're going to be transitioning to a stay-at-home parent, let's touch on this for a second. If you or your partner is going to be transitioning to be a stay-at-home parent, get life insurance now. While there are companies that offer life insurance once you're no longer employed, the goal of life insurance is to replace lost income. So it can be harder to get them to approve life insurance for people that don't currently have income. Though they will, some companies will look at household income. It's much easier and much cheaper often to do it when you're already employed. So do that. Get your life insurance before you quit your job and become a stay-at-home parent or your partner does. Okay? So make sure you get life insurance. And the last thing we're going to touch on is creating a full estate plan. This means having a will. This has even more myths and confusion than life insurance, but so many people think wills are only for the elderly, only for people who are very wealthy, and that's not true at all, right? Wills and trusts are for anybody 
who wants a say and where their assets go. And that includes your child. Do you want to say and who is going to care for your child if you or you and your partner pass away? And most of us would say yes, right? We want to have a very strong say, in which case we have got to get that will in place. Okay, we've got to get things lined up and ready to go. Um, you can do this in many ways. There's ways to DIY it for free. If you go to websites like tomorrow.me, if you have a very simple estate, um, meaning you don't have a lot of financial assets and you really just want to make sure that a guardian is named for your kids, that can be a good choice. If you want more help and more support in a more customized will, you can go one of two ways. You can use a company called Trust and Will. Um, so if you go to smartmoneymamas.com, forward slash trust and will, they will guide you through creating a full estate plan specific to your state, specific to your family, and really be able to update it easily. Okay. And then the third option is to use an estate attorney. If you have an all of a complicated estate, you have previous marriages, you have a blended family, um, you have assets in multiple states. It is very important that you make the investment and hire an estate attorney because they are going to make sure that the documents are proper, that you're not going to create more chaos after you, you pass away. And so you want to make sure you have that in place. Another good part of any estate plan is having your family emergency binder laid out. The family emergency binder is where someone can go to figure out where do you have bank accounts and how do you log in? How are your bills paid? Which ones are on auto pay? If I shut this bank account, am I suddenly going to lose power because the utility bill was on auto pay from that bank account and I didn't realize it and now they couldn't pay the light bill and they shut our power off, right? You want to make sure you have that emergency binder in place too. But that is something that when we talk about nesting, right? <laughs> Using that nesting energy to kind of get that estate plan, that emergency binder, all that thing in place can be a really powerful tool instead of feeding all that nesting energy into buying more stuff, right? You can use it to be productive as you get closer um, and make sure that you're protecting your budget and that you're only buying the things that truly matter to you. So I know we went through these seven steps really fast. Every one of these seven steps is going to be covered in future episodes where we're specifically just talking about those items throughout season one. But I'm going to open up for questions right after we recap really fast right here, which is to know where you stand financially is step one, to prepare for the baby expenses, including childcare, to understand your medical expenses. And that includes calling your insurance company. I know it's not any fun, but you have to call them, ask good questions, figure out what you could potentially owe, um, plan your maternity leave, talk to your HR department if you have one. If you're going to be a side hustler, talk to your clients, figure out what do you want to do to preserve income in the weeks that you're going to be gone, set an emergency fund goal and start saving for that emergency fund, get appropriate insurance, and then finally create an estate plan, both getting either a will or a trust um, and setting up your family emergency binder. So that's the, how do we plan for financially for a new baby? It's a lot of things. And I think that for many of us, becoming a new mom was a wake up call that we had to be more intentional with our finances, that we couldn't just, you know, fly by the seat of our pants because it's not just us anymore. It's, it's these little people that are entering our lives. And so for the first time, we're really involved in our finances. And I think that this is an opportunity to get clear on what you want, align your values when we set that baby budget, like we talked about, and think about money as a tool, money as a way to provide self-care so that you have less stress and less anxiety, money as a tool to create the life that you really want? What kind of job do you want? What kind of lifestyle do you want to put forward for your child? And how can we use money to get you there? And sometimes that's, those are going to be small changes at first. It can be saving $5 a month into your emergency fund as you build up momentum but it's just getting the ball rolling so you can get closer to the life you want. So if you have questions about how to financially prepare for a new baby, drop them in the comments below. If you're listening to this on replay or on the Smart Money Mamas podcast, know that we open up for questions for 20 to 25 minutes every episode of the Smart Money Mamas live show. You can join us Tuesdays at 1 p.m. to submit your own questions. Or if you're not gonna be able to attend live, oh, you can always submit questions the days before on Instagram and we will cover that as well. One of the questions that we got on Instagram Live while we wait for some of these questions to come in from our live audience was when do we start saving for college? And there's a reason that we didn't include saving for college in one of the steps of financially preparing for a new baby. And that is it can create a lot of stress for families to think about college. College is a huge expense and many of us are still living with student loans, in which case we feel very acutely not wanting our kids to have to go through that, right? Wanting to make sure that they don't have to face the student loans that we did. 
But there are more pressing, important things that we have to do with our money, preparing for our kids first year, getting that emergency fund in place, making sure our career is secure, that I want you to focus on that before you focus on college. If you get through these seven steps and you still have money in your budget, you still have family that wants to help you with a 529, the answer of when to start is as soon as possible. But it's as soon as possible once these other things are done, once you're retirement fund is fully funded, um, that you're doing what you need to do to protect your future self, and then you can start saving for your kid. Um, many, uh, at most every state has their own 529 plan. You want to find one that has low fees. If, unless your state has tax benefits for using the in-state plan, then use your in-state plan so you get those tax benefits. But it start as soon as possible based on what you actually are facing in your financial life. If you're not yet there, it's okay. There are options as we get closer to college. You can start saving when your kid is five, six, seven and still be completely fine. You can start saving when your kid is 12, 13 and help them outline different scholarship plans, different state policies different grants um, and financial aid to make sure that they get the, the education that they need. They will be okay, but make sure you are covering your own plan. All right. Um, Kim says, also make sure that you let the person know that you named them as your guardian of your kids. This is a great, great point. When you are working on your estate plan, anyone who is named in your estate plan, a guardian, a backup guardian, an executor of your will, a trustee of your trust, have very good conversations with them. Let them know what their responsibilities are and ask if they're comfortable with it. If you have somebody that's not comfortable taking in your kid or your kid's for whatever reason, they are worried about fin being financially strapped. They're overwhelmed with their own kids. You want to know that ahead of time. And you want to give the people that you're naming the permission and the space to say, I'm really honored, but I just can't. Okay. You want to make sure the people you named are okay with the responsibilities that they're going to have and that they're willing and able to do the things you need them to do. Okay. Carol McFadden had two questions. Um, is there a section edition of the workbook for second time moms, or do we just skip the new mom stuff? Generally, this is the new mom money plan is all about creating a system. So it's going to help you, um, price check, um, child care. It's going to help you ask the right questions to your insurance provider. It's going to help you make that list of what you need. And I think you would just think about it a little bit differently. And what I mean is when you go through the list of what you need as a new mom, there's checkboxes of whether you already have it or whether you and whether you want it or don't need it. And so as you go through that, you can just cross off what you already have for prior children and set a budget that's specific to this child. I think it's very helpful regardless of whether you're a first time, second time, or third time mom. And often as our families are growing, if we're feeling like, hey, we were a little financially stretched with two kids and now we're having a third kid, I'm overwhelmed. This kind of gives us an opportunity to go back to basics with the new model money plan. And so if you want to check out the new mom money plan, you can head to smartmoneymamas.com forward slash NMMP. That's new mama money plan abbreviated. And you can check it out. All right. Um, Carol says, I know this is subject subjective, but what's your opinion of people in debt payoff mode? Do you recommend strictly dork mode or kind of doing both payoff and saving for expected and unexpected costs at the same time? If you're in debt payoff mode, a, this is going to be personal. You are absolutely right. This is depends on what your values and your goals are. In general, I want to make sure that you have some cushion for baby stuff. I don't want you to be hustling your butt off, paying off debt, and then your baby comes and you need things that you didn't expect, and now you're going right back into debt. That is a really stressful thing for many families where it makes them feel like debt has become an inevitability, right? You worked so hard, and now you're increasing your debt again. It can be hard to restart your journey. So that tandem mode of saving for what you need, both the expected and unexpected and paying off debt often works for most families. Sometimes if you're in that really go, go, go mode and you're comfortable with that, saying we're going to use that go, go, go mode to set aside money for the baby stuff for the next three months. We're going to pause our debt payoff plan. We're just going to make minimum payments. We're going to save up a baby fund. And when that three months is done, we're going to go full back on debt. That's another option too. But you want to make sure that money is there so that you're not putting yourself back into debt right after you did all this work to get out of it. Okay. Maria Sanchez says, says do you recommend Aflac, Chelsea, as a backup support for medical matters? Aflac can be a great option. You want to make sure you understand what is covered and not what's not covered. And if there's any contradiction between any short-term disability you already have through work or disability coverage you already have through work. Um, this is just a matter of sometimes different postpartum uh, care is not covered by policies like Aflac. And you just want to make sure you're understanding what support you have and what support you don't have through that option and whether the cost makes sense for your family. Okay. But Aflac can be a great, great resource. 
Oh, I'll go ahead and take, take a sip of water here, guys. Overall, you can do this. There are options regardless of what your budget is, what your current financial situation is. I think that there is a lot of shame out there anytime it comes to marketing what new parents need for their kids, right? There's this idea that good moms buy this, that marketing. Um, moms that want their kids to be successful and educated buy this, right? I made a little comment earlier in this episode about selling kids educational toys at an age where they can't see more than 12 inches in front of their face, right? Newborn educational toys aren't a thing because your newborn is still developing, can't even hold its head up. You don't need to worry about those things. And so really getting clear on what's important to you and what do you really need? Um, you know, we come back to, to, you know, uh, Kate saying that her twins only chewed on each other. My son only used a cold carrot as a teething toy. You have a ton of options. There are things like your local buy nothing group, join that group. And if you don't see something that you're looking for, don't be afraid to post and say, Hey guys, I'm really looking for a stroller. Does anyone have a stroller and see what pops up? You can get things for free in your local community that other people might've thrown out. Go to consignment stores, check out, um, check out yard sales. And this is important because even though you might feel like, oh, I really want these new amazing things for my kids, many, many baby things barely get used. People buy them and it doesn't work for their kids or their kid used it for two weeks and then they grew out of it. Whatever it is that you'll find stuff that is practically brand new and you can get it for half or less the cost and save your budget, right? Get creative on what you need. And let, your kid really only needs a safe place to sleep, food to eat, and clothes to keep them warm. The rest of it is all bonus. And so if that's what you need to start with, making sure that they have diapers and clothes and a safe place to sleep and an easy way for you to get them around, right? That is where you start and you buy things as you need it. Like we said earlier on, be patient, all right? Lauren says, what are some ways to make room in your budget when you don't feel like you have any? And this is a great question. And so we talk about free switch offs in the motivated mama society sometimes, which is saying, what are your values? What do you want your life to look like? How do you want to feel on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you want to feel inspired or you know, philanthropic or whatever it is? And brainstorming free, low cost and expensive ways to get those things. And so when you need to make room in your budget, you might be looking at your budget and saying like, hey, this item, this thing that I do is really important to my happiness. And I want to keep that in the budget. And in general, I would say you absolutely want to do that. But in moments like this, where you have money that you're really going to need for an, a milestone, like a new baby coming, I want you to look at all those items, even the ones that feel non-negotiable and say, hey, is there a way to swap that out? Is there a free option that for a little while I could just save that money? And instead of, you know, going to get a pedicure, I could, you know, ask my spouse to give me an hour alone at home to watch a fa my favorite show and give myself a pedicure and take a break, right? And give you the same kind of self-care feeling and quiet feeling that maybe you got on the pedicure. Or maybe because you enjoy the pedicure because you go with your best friend. And so you suggest to your best friend that, hey, for the next couple months, can we just go for a walk around the park instead? I need to save this money. So any kind of optional expenses, it's finding ways to switch out. If you don't have that wiggle room in your budget, which not everybody does, then it's an opportunity for what are some other ways I can bring money in. This is looking around your house for things that you can sell that you don't regularly use. Research suggests that the average American family has $1,100 of stuff that they don't regularly use in their house that they could sell. So finding those things, finding the things that have been gathering dust in your basement, selling them on Facebook Marketplace, selling them on eBay, figuring out, hey, could I do a small side hustle one day a week, whether it's a very part-time job or picking up some freelance work or even just babysitting for a local family and bringing in some money to give yourself a little bit more breathing room. Those are all things to think about, but this is a moment to go through your budget. And when we do the where you stand part of your budget, to go through with a fine tooth comb and see what you're missing. One of the exercises that we do in the new mom money plan, we also do it in the Motivated Mama Society, is having people estimate what they spend. So write down your budget categories and, and guess how much you think you spend every month on groceries, on dining out, on whatever. And then you're gonna look at the last three to four months and average out what you actually spent and compare what you estimated to what you actually spent. Because for many, many times you think there's no wiggle room in your budget, but you're going to find that you're spending money on places you didn't even realize. And so it's really going through in a fine tooth comb, finding ways to cut. And when you can't do that, finding ways to creatively bring money in. 
All right. Um, Sarah, uh, Carol McFadden says for people without leave, don't qualify for FMLA. How do you get short term disability? So you can apply for short term disability on your own. There are things like AFLAC, which is basically a type of short term disability. You can apply for short term disability. Um, with on um, policy genius and other websites like that you can buy your own short-term disability it's typically more expensive for, than group plans but what i will say is almost all employers offer it as an add-on benefit it's a pretty standard one and so if you don't have it yet this is an opportunity to make sure you're keeping an eye open for the next time there's open enrollment and making sure that you get signed up all right. Carol says, thanks for this. We were trying to conceive after a miscarriage. I'm so sorry. I also had a miscarriage this spring. I know how hard it is. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of you. And, you, and uh, Carol's been applying to jobs like crazy because I'm burnt out in my field job and want a career. I know this is a risk if I get pregnant before landing a job or as a new employee. I know legally they can't discriminate, but there are big money fears around not having maternity leave insurance, etc. These are legitimate concerns, Carol. I think that, you know, while there are protections out there, there are a lot of ways that people try to cut corners and really leave new moms out of the workforce. It's very unfortunate, but when we talk about the gender wage gap, it is very much a motherhood wage gap. Single women uh, without kids make pretty similar money to single males. It's once they start having kids that you see that wage gap really build out. And part of that is because biases that continue to exist and the ways that the new moms can be expensive for employers. They have to have plans for your maternity leave to fill in gaps if you take time off. Um, and so that discrimination continues. Could this be fixed by socialized medicine and national maternity leave policies? Of course it could, but we can't fix that at this moment. So what I will tell you is, you know, think about that job change. I'm excited for you to make that change, but understand that even if your company offers maternity leave that you're, they're going to work with, um, they might not offer maternity benefits if you've been an employee for less than a year, which could less be about them and more be about the short-term disability policies most employers end up using as their maternity coverage, um, that it could impact uh, your ability to be promoted or even your ability to be hired. The best way to really think about it, if you're applying to bigger companies, kind of bigger, more corporate companies, is to go to a website called Fairy God Boss, <laughs> fairygodboss.com. Um, they, they are an anonymous aggregator of I'm going to try that again. <laughs> I'm running out of steam here. They're an anonymous or aggregator of reviews from women about their workplaces. You can search an employer and figure out what their maternity leave policies are, um, what how women think about their jobs and their ability to be promoted in those places. And that way you can get some of those questions answered without having to ask the person that you're interviewing with, which could of course feel like you're opening yourself up to some discrimination there. And so it's doing your real, your, research ahead of time. All right. All right, mamas, make sure that you've hit subscribe on YouTube, hit the little bell. So you're notified uh, for next week's episode next week on Tuesday, June 8th, we will be talking to Kristen stones from sense and purpose about how to save money as a new mama. We're not only going to dive into how do we save money on all those things that our kids need, but also on how to really build up our baby savings. But ahead of time, this was where Lauren was saying, asking earlier, how do we find room in our budget? If it doesn't feel like we have any, we are going to dive deep on that next Tuesday. Thank you so much for a fantastic episode one. I hope Hope you enjoyed this. Continue to submit your questions. We'll be watching both on YouTube and Facebook for ongoing questions. Have a fantastic day and keep talking.